Hey guys, welcome to the next episode of the Junk Drawer Show Sports Edition, where we talk about our NFL podcast. Uh, I hope you enjoy the episode. We're doing a new format where we talk about subjects and kind of break them down into smaller chunks so that it's a little easier for you guys to digest. If you have anything in particular you'd like for us to talk about or weigh in on, uh, fantasy football questions, facts, figures, anything like that, let us know down in the comments, guys, and enjoy. Mike Spillane. I have, I have a feeling about this draft. It is not negative, but it's not as positive as one would think. I would like you to break down for me your feelings on the draft. So round by round, um, first round and second round, I think we're solid. Um, I think beyond Andrew solid. Thomas, huh? You beyond solid. You guys, I think you did really well. Because first round, we got Andrew Thomas, which a lot of people thought was a reach because you had more athletic ones there, such as Judrick Wills and Tristan Wirfs. Uh, I think that Andrew Thomas, the more that I've watched tape of him and the more that I've looked into his, you know, just kind of his background, to me, he's the most solid and starter ready tackle that was available in this draft. Um, so that means he's going to probably spend a year at right tackle behind with Nate Solder at left tackle until we can fucking ship Nate Solder's shitty contract out of here and not have to deal with him anymore uh, because he's he, been he a giant waste around. of money. He's a pass around boy now. He Dude, he's, he's just a waste of money. That's really what it is. Second round, although I would have probably gone for different needs based on people that were on the board, Xavier McKinney was the best person available in the draft. But that's He the shouldn't one. have been there. He shouldn't he have, should have been. not have been there. So you took a top three three that some would argue top two tackle which is shoring up what you need which is give saquon space and the best safety in in the whole thing the one that i i wished cuba and i were facebook portaling saying i think it was we had the 26th pick yeah we were singing xavier xavier we were so excited that he fell apparently he has character issues i guess but i mean he was going to be he should have been the replacement for you for minka that's what he should have been. I know. Like, we, we were exci- we were doing a dance that I was drinking, we were dancing, everything was fine. Then they took a guy whose name no human can pronounce. Igbenagmi. Igbenagmi. Bless Monogamy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Gesundheit. I but- wanted Xavier McKinney. And then he fell another, what, eight picks to you guys. Yeah. No, it's true. It was surprising. I didn't I didn't expect him to fall. Um, but I think going that route made a lot of sense because we have a good experience with safeties out of Alabama. Um, we also have good experience at, at letting them leave. Um, so there's that. Uh, Everyone does that now. Every team. Landon Collins. Um, but anywho. Um, but then for me, the draft kind of gets a little. Did we do the best that we could? You know, uh, and that's where I kind of get like Matt Pert, I think, at tackle in the third round was a little bit of a reach for what his ability is. Uh, I mean, I'm Craig Craig knows this. I'm a UCF alumni. I love watching UCF. He played at Connecticut. Connecticut might as well just been a team of turnstiles like all season, like literally everybody's just beating the shit out of Connecticut and to the point to where they're now a D2 football school. Mm. Like they're not even in a conference anymore. Straight up downgrade. Exactly. They joined the Big East, so guess what? They're now fully in the Big East. That means you're not a football school in Division that's One how, anymore. That's how European soccer works. If you suck, you get kicked out. They yeah. need to do that shit in NFL, too. Create a secondary league of eight <laughs> teams that suck and only play, like, a different style of game at the beach or something, and then the <laughs> real football teams play, and you have to fight your way in. I don't like soccer, but I like that about soccer. Fair enough, fair enough. But see that, that that's where like it like I said though that's where the draft kind of gets iffy for me because Darnay Holmes I think is a guy who's very athletic really quick could be a potential uh, you know either kick returner or a, a nickel corner eventually uh, but I don't think he's going to be starting I think he's going to be more of a depth piece I think Shane Lemieux is going to be a little bit of a project the guard out of Oregon not going to be ready to come in right away obviously might take a year or two for him to be ready to be in the starting lineup. And that's when we finally decided to start going after our areas of need on defense, which is linebackers and edge rushers. The fact that we waited until round six, like I know that this isn't a deep draft class as far as pass rushers go, but our biggest need as a team, aside from offensive line this year, 
to me was the fact that we had no pass rush. It's legitimately non-existent. And right now we're banking on a, a unrestricted free agent tender right now on Marcus Golden for a team to not sign him in order to give us the chance to re-sign him on the cheap. We banked on that. And, and then, I don't know, it, it's just, it's questionable to me. The fact that we didn't value pass rush when there was good pass rush available at times. Um, like, for instance, there was a guy from Utah who fell that I think Dallas got like two picks before us in like the sixth round that they had a third round grade on. Like, a guy so, falls that far, why didn't you trade up and get him, you know? In in your watching of the draft, what was the most frustrating pick? What was the pick that was made that made you go, but why? And, uh, and who would you have rather had in that moment for me it was uh round three matt pert that's the one that's the but why because for me that's a little bit of a reach in an ideal world what i would have done based on what was on the board at that time i would have tried to trade up a couple picks to get a center because the center is something that we need uh and uh cushionberry the third from lsu so a national championship winning center was still available up until like 10 picks before we went and it's not going to be that expensive to trade a late third round pick for a mid third round pick. It's not going to be that much that you're going to have to give up capital wise. And I know that we're in a, <clears throat> a scenario right now where we don't want to sacrifice too much capital. And we're apparently uh, Gettleman said he does not want to sacrifice capital for next year's draft already. So who knows? I'm not sure about that, but so I'll pose the question. This is going to go to both of you guys because I feel like we've spent a lot of a lot of time on specific teams, and I like that. I like the specifics. But personally, for me, as an armchair GM, as at, that I am, and that we all are, especially come fantasy football time, Fun. I'm all about spending draft capital for next year because I don't know where I'm picking next year to move up and get my guys this year, especially with the situation that we currently find both both of your teams in the giants not setting the world on fire the dolphins not setting the world on fire if you can move a fourth fifth sixth seventh whatever next year in order to move up in this draft to get a guy who's your guy a guy you believe in do you pull the trigger on that yes yeah i i would say that that's a 90 percent yes the only time the te- the one out of ten that i just can't see it is is when guys that you didn't see come and fall, like what you guys snagged in Xavier, right? You you don't see that coming, and then you you take the pick. You do that can happen later in the draft also. There's tears to the NFL draft. There's and you, you guys said it. It was kind of a thin edge draft, right? You had Chase yeah, Young, yeah. you had arguably what Simmons and a few other guys, and then it was like, okay, that position we're gonna wait two rounds. Well, here's the thing about a draft, right? You're in round three, you're in round four. Everything else is irrelevant. It's only here. So if you think there's a guy that's a tier and there's a drop off after that, I think you do whatever the hell you can do to if you if he's there, you grab him and you don't you don't use capital to get more. You do what you're saying. You jump up 90 percent, you know, that 90 percent. But but one out of 10, there's going to be a guy there and you wait and you get him. You know, I, I, I just think that it's it's all about the strategy play. When you're late rounds, Cuba and I used to watch the whole draft, which I can't do anymore. They spread it out on too many days. It's not, I can't drink that much all those days in a row. <laughs> we watched the whole round one. It was like four and a half hours. And yeah, I yeah. liked it. Was, did you guys do it too? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. But, but it used to be Saturday, Sunday. So you'd get rounds one and two, and I think, or one, two, and three. I can't yeah. remember. I think and it was one, rest. two, and three. I think it was one, two, and three. And we would drink all weekend when we lived together. And it was this amazing thing. And that's when we knew a depth of player that just no adult over 30 can know anymore. You just can't. <laughs> I knew guys that were just barely in the business. They were holding jock straps. But yeah, long answer, short question. Yes. 